you can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. Christian overcome temptation? Um, first of all, uh, Pastor, the word temptation um, can mean temptation and it can mean trial. I mean, it means temptation and trial. Um, so I'll, I would like to deal with it in this way. Um, when it is trial, like the book of James, it says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, that is, and he said, he talked about the trial of your faith. So that temptation is trial. And that, that comes in, in many ways. For example, um, a young boy, maybe in the secondary school or university, becomes a believer. And the parents um, say, okay, 
you, you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, we would not give you pocket money or pay your school fees. And he starts facing those persecution. It's, a, it's the trial of his faith to make him give up. So that, like a husband doing that to a wife, you know, um, it can happen that your faith is being tried to make you give up. Sometimes it can be difficulties in business, in finances. So that is the trial of your faith. And that trial, James says, that it works patience. The trial of it, he said, count it all joy when you fall into diverse uh, temptations, knowing that the trial of faith works patience. And when you allow patience, he said, you become entire, complete, lacking nothing, wanting nothing. Then when you talk about, um, you know, some people could say, what if someone is tempted with sin? You know, um, the way uh, that was dealt with is a man is drawn away of his own lust. Uh, sin cannot so tempt you that you fell into it. It has to do with knowing who you are. If you're lusting after something, it's very easy for you to say, I was tempted and I, f I fell into it. Um, if you're disciplined, there's, you're hungry and there's money somewhere, you know it does not belong to you. You can't take it and say, because I was hungry. Because under the same circumstances, there'll be someone else who has control over his emotions and his appetite and um, he, he will not steal. He would rather, you know, take another option and not steal. But the one that says, I was hungry or the money was present, I needed it and I took it, has not disciplined or mastered, you know, um, his, um, his behavior. He doesn't have discipline in his life. So sin doesn't, it's not, it's not you are not tempted by sin. You're not, you're not a, a, a snake that can be lured by a magician or something. Every man is um, is drawn away of his own lust. So in that wise, Pastor, it is to um, focus on the Word of God and remember who you are. We already, uh, uh, the other question we answered, sir, he said, sin shall not have dominion over you. So sin cannot tempt you. You know, when you say something is tempting you. So to overcome temptation is for you to know who you are. You have dominion. Thank you. Thank you very much. In Romans chapter 12, I'll read to you from verse 1 into verse 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, what the Word is telling you here is that if you will renew your mind through the Word of God, you will prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you not be afraid of being tempted. See, because when temptations come, it's not strange. Jesus was tempted. To be tempted in itself is not, is not sin. You can be tempted. The point is, when temptation comes, it's only what you've got in you that will win. See, so... He already told us, be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. So if your mind is renewed by God's word, he says that he may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the, the working of God's word in your life is what will come out. He says you will prove necessarily what is that good. That means that which is good and perfect, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in the will of God. That's what will come out of your life. So that's the way to deal with temptation. Teaching couples to watch pornographic films. Let me read something to you from the Bible first Habakkuk chapter 2 from verse 15 it says war unto him that giveth his neighbor drink that putteth thy bottle to him and makest him drunken also that thou mayest look on their nakedness thou art filled with shame for glory Drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. 
Now, the implication of that is that our one's nakedness being made public is a shame when you're not a child. As far as God is concerned, that's a shame. Now, that started from the Garden of Eden. You remember the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve were in the garden. God placed them in the garden. And then when they did what God said not to do by obeying uh, Satan, the Bible tells us that their eyes were open and they found out that they were naked. And then they covered themselves with leaves because they found they were naked. They were ashamed and they hid themselves from God. Which means it's natural to try to hide one's nakedness. One's physical nakedness. And what did God do? God didn't say, oh, don't worry. You can move around like that. No, the Bible tells us that God slew an animal. And gave them the skin of the animal to cover themselves instead of the leaves. So God recognized that nakedness as giving uh, a feeling of shame. That's why I read that scripture to you. Now the question we ought to be asking is, what is the purpose of pornographic films in the first place? Why are they produced? And what is the meaning? When you say pornographic films, I hope you know what you're talking about. The word pony is from late Greek, meaning prostitute. And when you say pornographers, it's a writing about prostitutes. So it has something to do with some form of, uh, um, some form of debased human life. You see, so it's not something of honor. It's not something of glory. It's something of shame. Why produce it? It means it is done for a reason. And whatever that reason is, it's obvious that it's not positive. Christians don't do it. Those who believe in Jesus don't do it. They don't produce those kind of films because they understand there is a, a, a shamefulness in nakedness when you study from genesis all the way to the end of the bible revelation you discover the same trend the same trend so it's not right there will be no positive reason to use it understanding the reason for which it was produced it was produced by those who want others to have a feeling that they could have a prostituted life. See, and that's what the word actually refers to. So for that reason, I would say that Christian couples or any Christian for that matter should not use pornographic material. It's not wise. ask you questions directly pastor is anything wrong with astrology I want you to please expand shade on this is anything wrong with astrology well what is astrology maybe that's where we should start I, I, I'll um, read a verse of scripture that um, classifies astrology along with certain other things and that will begin to give you an idea, and then um, you get a good understanding. Isaiah chapter 47, from verse 13. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. You know. The Lord had said uh, there was going to be judgment for these people. And then he says, now, you, you let the astrologers save you. Let the astrologers, the stargazers, and the monthly prognosticators save you. 
You notice he grouped them together. The astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators. What does this mean? The astrologers are those who uh, study the arrangements of the celestial bodies, the, the various planets, um, the, the sun, the moon, and all of this, and they try to understand through observation the positioning of these things, the movement and position of these planets, and then they interpret the future or they foretell future events in human lives and in this way they they actually rob you of your relationship with the Spirit of God because your life is not controlled by the planetary arrangements your life is in the hand of God and God said to the children of Israel, I am your God. Your future belongs to me. So he gave them prophets to bring them revelation through the Holy Spirit and through his word. And that's what God wants us to do. He doesn't want us to try to look into the future by studying the planetary Arrangements. The same thing with stargazers. They look at the stars, the arrangement of the stars, and things that happen in the position of the stars. And then they seek to tell you what your future holds and events in your personal life. Now, it would have been okay if they tried to foretell um, physical events. If they tried to foretell things around the world uh, by way, maybe like weather and all those other kind of things. But where you have to deal with human lives who are related to God, you cannot interpret their lives through the physical arrangement of things in the environment. Because God has said that man is greater than his environment. He gave man charge over his environment. So his, his environment should not determine what happens with him. So that's what's wrong with astrology. That's what God is against it. And in first year in secondary school, Pastor Chris, is it wrong to be friends with a Muslim? No, it's not wrong to be friends with a Muslim. Or anybody else for that matter. But remember to be the main influence. Make sure you are the main influence. You are the one leading in the friendship. In every friendship, there's a head. Don't forget, in every friendship, there's one who influences the other. Make sure you are the one influencing the other. When I talk about the Bible, Jesus or oh God, she listens. But I'm not sure if I can still be her friend. You can. That's what I just said, you can. Is it also bad for a Christian to be in a bad mood? God bless you. Is it bad for a Christian to be in a bad mood? Well, um, the question is not whether it's bad for a Christian to be in a bad mood. Should a Christian be in a bad mood in the first place? Now, you can have a feeling of sadness. You can, you can feel like you're downcast for a moment. But the moment you recognize that that is happening to you, you should refuse it. You should say no. Never allow yourself to get depressed. Never allow yourself to get into a bad mood. So long as it's a bad mood, don't allow yourself. You catch yourself in a bad mood, you come out of it. You say, no, 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 I will not stay in this situation. Let me read something to you from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 13. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Listen to that again. It says, A merry heart make it a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of heart, the spirit is broken. A merry heart make it a cheerful countenance. See, if, you, if you're joyful inside you, if, you, if you're happy within you, 
He says, you would have a cheerful countenance. A cheerful countenance. It will show in your countenance. But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. See, by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. You don't want that in your life. So don't accept any kind of depression. Don't accept yourself to get in moods of anger or rage or anything like that. Because it means that your feelings are controlling you. And you're not going to let your feelings control you. You're going to control your feelings. That's what Christians do. You control your feelings. You use the word of God that you know in you to control your feelings. You let your spirit control your feelings. Because God lives in your spirit. And because God lives in your spirit, he puts his joy in your spirit. He puts his power in your spirit. He puts his ability in your spirit. You can do anything. Say, you've got the power to achieve anything, to be anything. You can do anything. Because God gives you the power to do them. And because you can, nothing depresses you. Nothing makes you sad. You see? Nothing gets a hold of your mind. Nothing. Because God has put his power within you. So, don't get into any bad moods. And by the way, I hope that you have received the Holy Spirit. Make sure that you are full of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you don't know how, I can send you some uh, materials that will be of help to you. Bless you abundantly. Amen. Thank you. My question is, is it correct to be sometimes angry with God? I believe in the Word of God and as a child of God, the trials I'm going through are too much for me to handle. And it happens that I pray and even tell God I am angry. And I ask him, how is it he wants me to glorify him? <laughs> I want to go through your question again carefully. And I want you to understand exactly what you said. And understand from the perspective of the scriptures what really was happening to you. You said, my question is, is it correct to be sometimes angry with God? It is not correct to be angry with God at all, at any time, for any reason. Didn't you hear what you called him? God. Do you know the meaning of God? The very definition of God means a divine personality who is totally sovereign. Otherwise, he is not God. God means he is sovereign, means he is all-knowing, he is all-wise, he is all-powerful. You see, so how could you be angry with someone who's all-knowing, all-powerful, all-wise, and sovereign? So the first thing is you don't even know the meaning of the word God. You see, so you don't even know the meaning. So those who get angry with God are totally ignorant of who he is. I'll take you to the next step. You said... I believe in the word of God. No, you don't. No, you don't. Do you know the meaning of the word of God? The word of God is the outbreathing of God. The word of God is a thought, the purpose of God, the desire of God revealed to man. That's the word of God. How could you believe in something you didn't know? You have to know the word of God to believe in it. And if God, I want to ask you a question. Assuming you were going through difficulties and God in his, in his sovereignty said to you, this is the life I want you to live. Why would you be angry? He hasn't even said that. But the point is, he knows everything. And He's created everyone for his own purpose. He's got power like the potter has power over the clay. You've got to understand that. Now, if you say you believe in the word of God, I find that really difficult. You don't believe. You think you do. For example, if you would study in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17, the disciples had been with Jesus a long time, and then they tried to cast out a devil from a demon-possessed boy, 
and uh, it didn't happen so they came to the master later on and they said master why couldn't we cast the devil out Jesus said to them when you read in 19th and 20th verses he says because of your unbelief they didn't think they were unbelieving they thought they were the believers Jesus said because of your unbelief that's why you couldn't do it now question why haven't you been able to change your situation you think God is responsible for your situation and he's not he said he gave you power to change your situation he said you could speak his word and change the circumstances of your life he said so if you don't know he said so it means you're still ignorant that he said so but he did so if you couldn't change your situation it's your problem the reason you couldn't is because of your unbelief like Jesus said to those disciples because of your unbelief now you may not want to accept that you are unbelieving but that would mean you don't even know what it is to believe see then there's another place to it faithlessness faithlessness here is different from unbelief it's one thing to believe what God is going to do what God has said about himself and about us it takes faith to act accordingly and it takes faith to speak accordingly when you say I am going through trials and they are too much for me to handle two things there number one you're ignorant of God's word because it says our trials or temptations God never allows us to go through the ones that are too difficult for us he says he only allows and I'm gonna read that to you in a moment he only allows us to go through those ones that are common to man I'll read that to you shortly so if you think that you're going through something that's too much you're ignorant and then your faith where is your faith why didn't you say like the children of Israel you remember the children of Israel who went to spy the promised land the 12 of them were sent 10 of them came back and said well uh, the trouble is too much we can't take the land it's like saying the trial is too much they said uh, there are giants there it's impossible for us to take it we can't we saw the giants and we were too small for them but two among the 12 said something they are bread for us we can take the land they boasted in God why aren't you boasting in him you might say well I did before and things didn't work out well that's because he boasted in unbelief without realizing it so that's where the problem is so when you say I'm going through trials that are too too much for me to handle of allegedly being gay firstly be yourself see um, if people have an opinion of you that's their problem not your problem all you have to do is ensure that you don't give them the reason to think so or if they want to think so that's their problem you can't live your life under the shadow of their opinion see you can live your life under the shadow of their opinion you've got to come out of their opinion you have to come out of that bondage you can live your life that way see it's either they change their opinion see if you keep living your life the way you ought to live and make progress in your life sooner or later they'll have to change their mind or else miss the benefit of knowing the real you see so remember um, your life is for a purpose and so don't let the opinions of others determine the limits of your life so that's the way to deal with it be yourself don't try to impress them don't try to live your life to their expectations so never try to change their opinions they will change their opinions as you continue to make your progress they'll change their opinions if they don't they'll miss the blessing of knowing the real you so, and that will be their loss and not yours 
So don't live your life um, trying to please them. That's the way. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures, click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures, click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. Options were the Christian and demons, the lying spirit in 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 21 to 23, and Christianity and denominations. Well, all of this you can also participate in on the, on the blog and express your thoughts. There are many others expressing their thoughts on several of these things, and I really uh, appreciate that. So make sure you get involved 
on the blog as well. But the one I'm going to deal with now is the one you chose for us to talk about. And that is men and long hair. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, from verse 4 to verse 14, it talks about a man dishonoring his head by covering it when praying. And that a man brings shame unto himself by wearing long hair. Does this mean it is wrong for a man to have long hair? What is the significance of this portion of the Bible? So we go straight to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I want to read from verse 1 so that you can be in good perspective with this. And I might even take you to the previous chapter a little later. All right. It says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonored his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesied with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. But all things of God, judging yourselves, is it comely that a man pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. All right. Question. Does this mean it is wrong for a man to have long hair? What is the significance of this portion of the Bible? How long is long? How long is long hair? I'm not sure that the Bible, in any place in the Bible or in, in, or in, the, uh, in Bible history, there was a, a definite length that was given for a, a man's hair to grow after which it becomes long. Now, we have to understand here what the teaching is about by being in the context, understanding the context of the presentation. And so I'm going to take you into the previous chapter so you know where Paul was coming from in this teaching here. And so you can understand the instructions. So this is chapter 11. And so we'll move backwards here into chapter 10. And uh, pick a comfortable place because a long chapter dealt with so many different things. And so I would go straight to um, uh, verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. You see, in that chapter 10, he addressed several issues in the house of God. And uh, he also talked about the environment. Others among whom they lived. And the things that happened between them and others. And so, he got here over in the, in the 31st verse and says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense. Verse 32. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Look at that again. He says, don't offend anyone. Don't offend the Jews. Don't offend the Gentiles. And don't offend the church of God. What's he dealing with here? He's talking about our way of life. The things we do, he says, should be to the glory of God. And we should not become an offense to those around us. Whether the Jew, the Gentile, or to the church of God for that matter. 
Look at that. Verse 33. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Now remember, the Bible was not written in chapters and verses. And so, we might as well read from here all the way into chapter 11. Because that's the way it was written. It wasn't written in chapters and verses. Chapters and verses were given for easy reference. So, the way Paul wrote it would go from verse 33, chapter 10, into verse 1, chapter 11. As a continuous um, uh, passage of his letter. So we read again from verse 33. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. He says, hey, I don't be an offense to the Jews or to the Gentiles or to the church of God. Even as I please all men around me, I please everybody. And I, 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 I don't want to do it for my own profit. I do it for the profit of others. For their salvation. Because I want them to be saved. Then he goes on to say. So copy my example. That's the beginning of verse 11. Copy my example. As I also I am following Christ. Then he says in verse 2. Now I praise you brethren. That you remember me in all things. And keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. Then he brought up a new thought. In verse 3. But I would have you know. So it's still in the context of dealing with our environment. We're dealing with those around us. And so he comes up with this customary thing about men covering their head or not covering their head and women covering their head or not covering their head. And in that society, they cover their head. And so he, he compared it to natural situations. He's trying to say, look, this custom is all right. There's nothing wrong with it. He says, judge yourself. I mean, is this wrong? He says, Men have short hair. Women have long hair. Because the, the long hair was given to them for a covering. So if in the society we find that this group covers or the other group doesn't cover, he says, hey, I want you to follow what's available there not to be an offense. Now look at this. Because when they went into the churches, the Gentiles were there. The Jews were there. They also came to the churches. For the Jews... The women veiled their hair as a submission, a sign of submission to their husbands. They covered their hair. It was a sign of uh, humility. That's what it was. And then the Gentiles also did the same thing. They covered their hair. And those who were caught in prostitution were shaved as a, a sign of disgrace. And then those women who were, who were hallowed went around without covering their hair. So it was a sign that either a woman had been caught in hallowtry or was a hallowed. If she was caught, she was shaved. If she was out patronizing uh, uh, those who were coming for her, she left her head as a sign. That she wasn't owned by any man. And so Paul said, if you're not going to cover, then also be shaved. Because it's the same thing. If you are ashamed to be shaved, then why don't you get covered? See, so, and then, he, so he, he was dealing here with a customary thing. And, and this is very important. This is very important because of what we're going to see a little later. So he was dealing here with a customary thing. And then he related it to natural circumstances. And said, hey, is it alright for a man to pray with his head covered? Because, see, uh, he's the image of God. Let's go there. He says here in, uh, from verse 7, For man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. And then he, he says in verse 13, Judging yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you? So he's here looking at 
uh, a customary thing that was not offensive to Christianity and that had something to do with uh, natural teaching. And he says, this is okay. And I want you to act this way. See, remember something. The priests, the priests of the Old Testament covered their head. They covered their head. In their full regalia, the high priest had his head covered. Did God not hear his prayer? So this is not a suggestion at all by the Apostle Paul that men should be uncovered because the priest was a man. And God gave the instructions. And Paul is looking at natural circumstances. And so we have to understand that he wasn't giving a, a law to the church. Incidentally, um, because, of this, because of this parochial uh, view by many, even some of the translations of the Bible are misleading in this regard. Now I'm going to show you something um, in a few verses down here. So, it doesn't mean that a man must not have long hair. But we already understand that naturally when a man has very long hair, it, it, it does get the attention of those around us. You know, it, it's, just, it's much like smoking, for example. Well, the Bible doesn't say anything about smoking. And if you were smoking ar around certain Christians, they're going to be surprised. Hey, man, why? Because they think it's a dirty habit. They think something's wrong with it. You know? There are many things like that um, that the Bible doesn't say anything about, but naturally around us, and people will raise an eyebrow. Okay? They'll raise an eyebrow because of what you're doing. Not because that thing is wrong necessarily in the sight of God, but around you, they'll be judged wrong. And that's what the Bible teaches us, how to behave in the presence of others. And that's actually the summation of Paul's talk here. Now, let me show you something. Uh, you go down to, I'm, I'm going to read from verse 14 um, to the end of that particular discussion, which is 16. Doth not even nature itself, 14, doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering? So you see, her hair is given her for covering. If her hair is given her for covering, why must she need a veil? So these are um, expressions of symbolisms. Okay, notice something. Verse 16. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Now that's the scripture that many have wrongly translated and held to these things. That we must have uh, the women cover their hair and the men not cover their hair. And they forget that this is not exactly what the, the scripture is presenting at all. Because the priests covered their hair and they were, they were the ones to lead the prayers to God. And God heard them. You see. Now, it says, but if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom. Neither the churches of God. Now, some have said that this scripture means that we have no other custom except this custom of hair covering. That's not what Paul was saying. What he's saying here is very simple. He says, if any man seem to be contentious, if you want to become argumentative, actually he says, if a man seem to be fond of argument, that's the expression of the word that was translated contentious. The Greek word means to be fond of argument, to be argumentative. As a way of life. As an attitude to life. That's what he's saying. Now, he says, we have no such custom. Now, when he says we have no such custom, he's not referring to the custom of covering hair. It means we have no such, in fact, the, the, the Greek is sonethia. It means attitude. It means a way of doing things. It means we have no such way of this argumentative behavior. He says, if you, if you want to be argumentative about, argumentative about these things, we, we don't have that kind of lifestyle. We're not going to be arguing with you. We're not going to join issues with you. That's exactly what he's saying. We will not join issues with you. If, you're, if any man is going to be contentious about this, we're not going to join issues with you. If you're fond of arguments, you love arguments because of these things that I've said, he says, hey, we don't have that attitude and the churches of God don't have that attitude. So we're not going to argue with you. So he wasn't referring 
to the custom of covering hair or not covering hair. So don't make an issue out of it. Don't make an issue out of it. There's no definite length of hair that makes a man's hair long or that makes a, a, a man's hair short. And um, it's important that we do not become offensive to our society in the way, in the structure of our society. That's the teaching that he was giving us. So long as those things that are demanded of us or desired of us are not offensive to God, There are countries, especially in Africa, where people are suffering in the hands of dictators and cruel leaders. My question is, is the life of one person, the dictator, more important than the thousands that suffer at his hands? Why does God let these leaders stay in power for a long time and have their way? <laughs> Thank you. Well, there are certain things we need to realize. And um, firstly, Generally, these leaders that you're talking about are not aliens who have come from other countries to use up authority in the countries that they govern. They're usually citizens of those countries where they have become leaders. Which means the leaders are pulled from the, the people from their own people. How did the people produce such despots? How did the, the people produce such kind of leaders? They came from among them. Recognize this. Every nation gets the leadership that it deserves. That's important. Every nation gets the leadership that it deserves. The leaders come from among the people. How do you solve the problem then? Firstly, education. Education is important for every country. Secondly, agriculture. Throughout Africa and other nations that have these kind of problems, they require agriculture. Any way of thinking. And if you educate the people, you will get leaders from among the people that you have educated. If you culture them properly, you will get leaders from among those that you have cultured. So the problem is, most of Africa is uneducated. They don't understand the sanctity of life. Most don't understand the importance of good governance. And so they've struggled their way to where they are. And um, they've gotten leaders from among them that way. And remember, most of the world was that way one time. Europe, Asia, most of them were that way. They also had some despots. They also had tyrants, terrible leaders, one time or the other. See, but through education and reculturing of the people, they have come to where they are. That is the solution for Africa as well. So it's not that God is leaving these people in office. Where do you want him to get the leaders from? Bring you leaders from some other country? The problem is, when you take out these leaders and new ones come in, sometimes they are worse than the previous ones. And that has been the experience in most of Africa. So the problem is not just who is the leader presently, the problem is the pool from where we get the leaders. And so if we want to make a change, we must make a change in the pool from where the leaders come. So begin now to work towards the future by educating the people and reculturing the people. Uh, public enlightenment of some kind will be very beneficial. Thank you. Please explain to me what dedication is all about and how important it really is. As a born-again Christian, why is it important to get your children dedicated? St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, from verse 22. Now the scriptures 
don't directly instruct us on that but gives us clear guidance on what to do from verse 22 and when the days of our purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord now it's talking about Jesus Christ when he was a baby and just a few days old the Bible says when Mary's days of purification were ended she brought her baby to Jerusalem according to the law of Moses they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord to present him to the Lord verse 23 as it is written in the law of the Lord every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord now what this means is that in the law of Moses God had said that when a child was born as the first child really the male he said shall be brought to the house of God shall be brought to the Lord as an offering to the Lord now the woman also had her offerings to give according to the law at the end of the days of purification that was why Mary had to do this so you notice there are two things here first was Mary's own condition and then the child had to be brought to the Lord now that was in the Old Testament in the New Testament we all belong to God now notice that this child was to be brought to the Lord as an offering to the Lord because the Lord said every man child that opened the womb belonged to him now the other children belong to the parents so God made a choice but we all are now in Christ now if that child that was chosen by the Lord being the first child had to be brought to the Lord to be presented to the Lord formally it just explains why we do it we all now belong to the Lord every child whether the first or the second or the last every child that is born of a Christian should be brought to the house of the Lord to be presented to the Lord because now it's not just the first child or the man child that opens the womb but every one of us that is chosen of God we all belong to him now and that's why we do it You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. Thank you.
you can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the homepage and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now.